Hi, this is Gowron, Robert O'Reilly, in Star Trek. Go to Neil Before Pod. Now. 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 Goodbye. Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. Hello and welcome to another edition of Neil Before Pod's interview segment. I'm your host Craig McKenzie and I have the pleasure of chatting with Manu Ramey, star of Star Trek Voyager and uh, has an upcoming project called The Circuit that you may have heard of. If not, you'll have heard of it by the end of this podcast. So welcome. Hi, how are you man? I'm good, how are you? I'm pretty good. Just uh, I'm actually sort of fried but I've got five days left. I've been doing a, a Kickstarter for the project you just mentioned and I don't know if anybody's ever ran one out there, but it's it's pretty exhaustive stuff. You know, you're you're in front of the computer for twelve to sixteen hours a day and power napping. And my team totally ditched me because the people on my project are are like you know they're real top notch filmmakers, so they're off working on other stuff. And I was just left here to run this thing on my own. But we've done pretty well for for me just uh, burning the wick at both ends. So I'm going to start running on fumes sometime soon then. Yeah, five days from now, I'm just going to like take a two-week break and just read books and watch movies. <laughs> well earned, well earned. Uh, so we'll just start with a, with a bit about yourself. Uh, you've done quite a lot of acting, so how did you first get into it? You know, What kind of got you bitten by the, the cliched acting bug that everyone talks about? My parents brought me to a play called Peter Pan at a community theater when I was five years old in Boise, no, McCall, Idaho. And I knew right then, I, I have that memory solid, deep, and entrenched in the I am, uh, entrenched in my personality. I can think back. It's one of those memories that's just seared in, you know? Um, and I, rec- I can remember the even the, the way the, the light in the room and the stage and the actors on the stage. And they, they started thinking happy thoughts. And I remember one by one, they started flying around on their wires. And, uh, and um, that was that. I mean, I was sitting there and I was like, I want to do that. I want to be up there. And um, I would tell my parents and every, we, we were on the road a lot because my parents were hippies. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so every time we stopped, I would always try to get into community theater or at least the school that I was in, productions. And, and when I was 17, I was lucky enough to be in a, a production like 400 miles north of L.A. And there was a manager in the audience, and she just said, hey, what are you doing after high school? I said, I want to study acting. I want to do film and television. And she said, perfect. I manage actors. Why don't you move to L.A., pack up your stuff? I said, okay, I will. Um, and, you know, then there's a bunch of 20 years in between now and then. But um, within three years, I was on Star Trek, and that helped and uh, been working pretty much off and on ever since. That's good. Sounds like quite a profound experience, uh, seeing Peter Pan then. Yeah. Isn't it for everybody? <laughs> Depends which version. Uh, I vaguely I remember the Disney version when I was young, but I think Hook did it for me, and I loved Hook. Oh, Hook was fantastic. I was probably like what fourteen, fifteen when Hook came out. I was, uh, I loved it. Remember Rufio? Rufio. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. yeah, I'm sure there was a Kickstarter for a prequel about that character as well. Yeah, and that fantastic uh, man, Robin Williams. What a stud muffin in his prime, <laughs> and. Uh, Dustin Hoffman with the tick, tick, tick thing going on. He, with the, so good. He had that little tick. That was fantastic. Yeah. And even grew the mustache so that he <laughs> accentuated it. True it's method. Tough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do you watch a lot of TV or films yourself? Kind of things that are on at the moment or maybe things that you've just caught up on recently? I sort of go through periods of, um, not watching anything and focusing on making television and film. And then 
then I'll go through periods of severe depression where I just watch television and film. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I do. <laughs> so what, are, what was the last sort of selection of shows that you, you watched? Uh, re- recently, I watched a, a good film that my friend made uh, called A Thousand Junkies that played in Tribeca, where another film that I was in that I didn't get to see yet, but I'm looking forward to seeing, called Literally Right Before Aaron was playing. And then I watched a documentary called The 7-5 about this corrupt police pre- precinct. That oh, was, yeah, I saw that. It was really good. Oh, yeah. my God. I mean, just fascinating. And and you got to think, too, that, like, that's not prob- like that's not a uncommon story. That's just the one they found, you know? Yeah. I'm sure that that's happening all over the place. It's just, oh, it creeped me out. Um, <laughs> but then as far as, like, I, I, this year I really enjoyed Stranger Things and uh, the new season of Black Mirror earlier this year. Now, my sh- new show is very much like Black Mirror, except we want to do uh, Black Mirror with heart and hope and light and color and a better future and but still awesome science fiction storytelling you know yeah uh, just not so dark every everyone every black mirror episode was pretty dark um some of them had some light in them but um <laughs> similar to what we're doing be good to bring a bit of lightness back to television um yeah not enough of it i find no i don't think we have time right now to be pessimistic i think we need some <laughs> some good um you know, looking for the light within ourselves and, and making the world a better place sci-fi. So that's yeah. what we're trying to do. Cool. So I was looking through your history and I know you've been in a lot of things, but one thing that really caught my eye was a ro- one episode role on Sabrina, the teenage witch. Uh, I mention it because I absolutely loved that show when I was younger. And I actually remember the episode you were in, you played the character known as sore throat, you know, parodying yeah. the, the Watergate scandal. Um, yeah. Can you talk a bit about your experience on there? You know, what was it like working with Melissa Joan Hart and all the rest of the cast? And did you meet uh, the cat? I never, I did not meet the cats. No, I saw the cats. I didn't meet them. They never said hi to me or anything. <laughs> but I, I did, um, I do know that I was young enough. I was probably 19 or something and 20 or something like that. I was young enough not to know why I was called sore throat. <laughs> Um, and then I found that out later in life when I got a little bit more intelligent. Um, I remember it was fun. I remember being, I, I wish that I had a good story for you, but I, Melissa Joan Hart just wasn't very nice to me while I was on the oh, set. Yeah, she was, I think she'd been on the show for so long and I don't know. She's probably a pretty cool person, but the week that I was there, she just wasn't very nice to me and she she wouldn't rehearse with me. And she just like, you know, I was a guest star of the week, you know? And so, Mm. um, I, I, I felt slighted by her. And then I remember a couple times out in, in town when I was younger and I used to hang out in the, you know, young Hollywood scene. I'd run around with all these kids that like are super famous now, A-listers and stuff. And, Melissa a couple times bumped into me and I was like, Hey, how are you? You know, I was, I played a character on your show and she would just roll her eyes and walk away. And I was like, what, <laughs> what did I do to you? I, you know, so that's a shame. I'm, yeah. Well, thank you but, for the, the honest answer, you know, instead of saying, was, yeah, she was great. <laughs> uh, she wasn't great. She was really mean, but, yeah. uh, you know, she, she, you know, might've just been having a bad week. That's the thing about celebrity. You know, you can just, you can be grumpy one time or, or, you know, something can be going on in your life. And, and so you treat a couple people that you don't really know outside of your life, uh, not as well as you should. And then that story travels and then suddenly everyone thinks you're a prick. And yeah. I, I, I don't necessarily, you know, I don't know her well enough to know if she's a good, good lady or not, but she just wasn't nice to me that, that those few days. What was that guy's name? I, he, I don't remember what, who he played, but he was like the old older guy with the mustache. Maybe oh, he was, Martin Martin Mull, Willard yeah. Craft. Yeah, yeah, he was nice. He was he was a cool guy. He was friendly and fun. Mm. I liked that character as well. I remember too much about that show. And he would he would smoke cigars out back, and we and just and ch- ch- chat with me about acting, and then he was really nice. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, so another show I loved was One Tree Hill, and I remember you were on that for a few episodes. Um, it seems uh, it was a bit more involved as a role. So, kind of, who were the biggest jokers on set, and you know, the, out of who you got to work with? Um, what was it all well, that experience like? Well, season nine of of One Tree Hill was I was I played a villain named Billy, yeah, and he, the drug dealer. Yeah, he was a really bad guy. He wasn't. A good, he was nothing redeemable about him whatsoever. Just not a good person. Uh, and he got what was coming to him. It, I, I can't remember the actor's name, and I really should because his name is in my phone. But the the man who played Dan uh, was a really Paul really, Johansson. Yeah, Paul Johansson was a really good dude and a good director. He also directed an episode that I was in. Um, and he was a lot of fun to hang out with on set and he treated you like part of the cast. And, um, you know, I was part of the cast. I did six episodes or something, but you know, I, I wasn't there for all set seven years, you know, there's yeah. a difference between, but he took me right in as a, you know, as a family member. Um, and Tyler Hilton was a real sweetheart too, a really nice guy. And I ended up working with Tyler Hilton recently, no, well, not recently, but a couple years back on a short called instant that I'm still really excited for people to see Roddenberry entertainment made it and they haven't released it yet. It's been at a few festivals and I don't know what Rod is planning on doing with it, whether he's going to release it on his site or, or what, but um, it's a really brilliant, heartfelt, wonderful film. And working with Tyler again was, was fun. It was neat to, to have gotten off one show and then just bumped into him again randomly on that. Just a, a sweet, really pleasant, nice person. Was he acting in the short or was music or a bit both? Uh, he was acting uh, in, in, um, in uh, I know he did music for One Tree Hill too, but I, I don't remember if he wrote, I think he might have written a song for the end credits of Instant. I'm, I don't remember. Maybe. Just have to watch it and find out, I suppose. Oh, but he's just acting in it. But yeah. I think end credit music might be a Tyler Hilton uh, like piano number. I'm not. I don't. Re I don't rightly recall. But the the film is excellent, and people should be knocking down Rod Roddenberry's door to put it out already because it's it's really lovely. Cool. Um, yeah. So you were also in Twenty Four, which was a massive show back in the day. Um, yeah, that was fun. Yeah. Um, was it really intense working with Kiefer Sutherland? I hear he can be quite an intense guy to work with or work near or be around. It was, it was exactly the opposite of intense. He was the, one of the most chill, sweet, calm, uh, kind individuals I've uh, ever worked with. And in fact, the farther up the chart you go, and I've found this to be very true, and it must be a stereotype. There must be, you know, um, gaps in the in the rule but the more famous people that i've met the nicer they've tended to be hmm. and it's very strange like i worked with the clint eastwood and leo dicaprio and, and jay edgar for a couple days sweet humble kind joking walked right up to me and uh, well if it isn't manu uh, uh blah 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 <laughs> <laughs> and elbowed me, you know, just to put me on ease right away. It was Uncle Eastwood, you know. Um, Leo came up to me and stuck his hand out and just, "Hey, what's up, man? I'm Leo, Manu. Hey, let's knock this out. Let's work. Let's just just throw anything at me. Let's have fun, you know." Kind. Um, and the same thing with Kiefer is he was just really kind. He, I bummed a couple cigarettes from him. We were both smoking at the time. Um, <laughs> I don't know if he smokes anymore, but, you know, it was, and he would take the time, you know, after we shot to sit around and sh talk Hollywood and talk life. And, you know, he didn't run back to his trailer and hide. He was a really good person. Sounds awesome. Which is, yeah. you know, uh, really an easy thing to do. If you're, if you're holding down a show, if you're the lead on a show, you have a lot of work. So it, it makes a lot of sense to run back to your trailer and, do your job and learn your lines and, and to take time to hang out and have a coffee and, and talk with the guest stars. Um, people don't know the kindness in that. Mm. Cool. Um, yeah. So, 
Yeah, so on to a uh, little little show called Star Trek you were on. Um, you were quite a prominent role in that. You know, Echeb was, was around for quite a long time, um, well, which was A couple of really years good. there. Yeah. I don't know how many years in time it was, but it was a couple of years in Earth time. Yeah, yeah, and um, certainly a recurring role. You know, I uh, have a good memory of Echeb turning up quite a lot and complimenting yeah. Seven of Nine and interacting with pretty much all the cast regularly. So, yeah. Um, what drew you to that character, um, and you know how did you feel about the way that was handled? Uh, fate. I can, you know, I, when I think back about it, it's all fate. Uh, there's no explanation. What drew me to the character? That I guess that wasn't the question. How, but it was just—it's a weird series of circumstances that led me to get that part. I one of my first auditions in Hollywood was for a show called Senseless. A uh, movie with Marlon Wayans and David Spade, and I, I didn't have my SAG card, and I had I got the audition through my agent, and um, I was horrible in the movie. I got the part. <laughs> Ron Serma cast me. I was terrible, and I had to shoot the line like forty times. And I remember Penelope Spears getting up and th- throwing a notebook and yelling at me, and you hold the needle like this. And it was a scene with Matthew Lillard and, and Marlon Wayans. And I was starstruck and 17 and just didn't didn't know what I was doing uh, on camera. I had done a lot of stage, but I had really no idea what film acting was. A couple of years later, my agent and his uh, the casting director, Ron Serma, were sitting together in a, in a pedicure place, getting a pedicure. And Ron said to my agent, I've got this cool role for a kid because my, my agent was a younger uh, – you know, he represented uh, kids and young adults. I was 21, so I was about to leave him. You know, I was growing up, but uh, still with him. And he said, you got to see Monty Wente Remy. And Ron was like, no way. I, I hired that kid for Senseless. I'm never going to see him again. <laughs> Not a chance. I heard bad back. You know, I heard bad things back. And my agent was like, well, that was two years ago. He knows what he's doing now, damn it. And you're going to see him. He's amazing. He's perfect for this. And my agent, the lady that was doing his toenails, cut his foot. And um, now he said, I bled for my client. Look at me. Look at me. My foot is bleeding all over the this this stupid, you know, these towels. You're, you're going to see my client. Ron was like, all right, fine. I'll read him. I went in and I blew the doors down and I, I was, you know, I, I just, I wanted that role so bad. I, I watched Star Trek growing up and it was just sort of perfect timing, perfect circumstance. My agent happened to be getting a pedicure at the right time, <laughs> <laughs> you know, all sorts of weird. So Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's very, it's, and it's just so it's just too many weird sets of circumstances. Um, and it is so Hollywood. It's always like that. For instance, that first episode, I was doing, um, I, I auditioned to play the bad guy. Mm-hmm. And the guy that got the bad guy part, they called me. They said, I don't want you to play Borg number one. We're sorry you didn't get the role. But we would like you to play Borg number two, the, the sweeter one that doesn't die. And I'm like, oh, man, well, okay. Yeah, that's still cool. I get to be on Star Trek. All right, I'll do it. So that kid ends up dying. Each of ends up hanging around and being on the show for two years. And then 15 or 16 years later, just 10, 17, 18 years later, God, this year I'd go to play the bad guy in that in this movie called Diverted Eden. And who's playing the good guy but that kid from Star Trek <laughs> um, that that played the bad guy? And I, I oh. was like, I was like, what the heck? What are you doing here? Um, I can't believe it that his name is not coming to the to my. Oh, that's going to drive me nuts if I can't think of his name. <laughs> um, hold on, I'm going to look it up. But I mean, that's that's very Hollywood. It's these weird sets of circumstances where you're like. Okay, why? And he was he's an actor now that lives in New York and yet he's doing this movie in in Los Angeles and I'm like why am I suddenly finding myself working with him again 18 years later? It's a very I mean, small full circle. 
Yeah, full circle. Small, small world. Yeah. Uh, especially within the, the, the acting game. You find all these magical little moments that lead you to different people, and it's, it's pretty neat. Yeah. And I, I can imagine being on Voyager would have been would have been a great experience. You know, I see from conventions there's quite a lot of characters there uh, with Garrett Wong and Duncan Robert Duncan McNeil. You know, they're sort of notorious jokers. So did that sort of thing happen a lot? Did you ever get involved in any of their on set pranks? Uh, I had a lot of fun with the guys. Every one of those guys, and Ethan Phillips is is such a wreck and a lovely, lovely wreck of a human being. He's so so fun. Um, such a good actor too. I'm really looking forward to working with him in the circuit. I want this show to blow up so bad. Um, it, it, you know, Robert Picardo also just kind, intelligent, a blast. Beltran was fun. It, Tim Russ is a joker too. Tim was always, you know, he played the Vulcan. So he had any time he broke character or said something funny or did something funny, he would always time it in some, uh, a great place, you know, uh, <laughs> And and basically, when the boys were on set, it was always joke time. It was you know, and then when when the captain showed up, we would all kind of straighten up and <laughs> on our acting faces. Um, but God, yeah, when it was just the guys on set, it was like it was really kind of hard to work. In fact, because they had worked for seven years together, six you know, six years by the time I got there, and. So they were, you know, off camera messing with each other and, and arcing eyebrows and looking, you know, just, you know, doing funny things to each other because they were so ingrained in their characters that they could do it with their eyes closed. And so it was very, you know, it was tough for me to try to keep up with them. And it, it was a great experience because as a young actor, uh, they gave so much and then also tested you and, and prepared you for what was to come and, you know, later years of, of showing up on a set with, you know, movie stars and, and big actors that you've got to keep up with. They, they were all really talented folks. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a shame that you, there was very little of the kind of levity between certain characters on, on the actual show, because it sounds like that certainly Garrett Wong wanted Harry Kemp to be a lot funnier than he ever was. And, uh, and Robert Duncan McNeil got a lot to do, but I think, other actors have talked about how they, they wish they could have put more of themselves into the show. And uh, I don't know. Um, I'm guessing everyone just got on with their jobs on set and things like that. But um, Ryan, imagine... Spahn. Ryan Spahn, that's the kid's name. I'm sorry. Oh, right. <laughs> Ryan Spahn, who played Borg number one when, uh, uh, yeah. I, I'm, I've had the same experience. You know, uh, Ichev was such a, a, a good boy and so serious and so. Never, you know, he, I think he cracked a smile maybe twice because he was bored. He was very, you know, and there was no levity in each of He was, you know, all business. And, um, I wanted an episode so bad where he got to go into the holodeck and maybe get to be somebody else, play a different character, be more fun. Um, a boat never got the opportunity. I think I, I bet, I bet you a lot of us felt that way because, mm-hmm. It's a serious show, and then when they did, when they did make jokes, it was always kind of like just, you know, subtle humor. You know, there wasn't huge, huge jokes on Star Trek. I think they're afraid of losing. Like I love the, I think the you know the old films and the new films with the new cast uh, of the the Spock, Kirk, Bones. I think they do it the best with keeping the levity in there. And uh, I think that's what one of the things that the new films did so well is it matched the fun levity that those old guys uh, have with each other. Yeah. Although there was the episode where you got to joke around with Q a bit. I mean, you were the, the straight man in that situation, but um, but still, that was quite a cool little pairing. I'd like to see more of that. Yeah, Q got to joke around. I had to be the straight man, funny man. <laughs> And I, and I, you know, and then that also, I, that episode, I'll never live it down because it's now everybody calls me itchy and I, it's, and people <laughs> think it's funny and I'm like, oh, come on. It wasn't that funny. <laughs> it's, a little funny. Like, it's, it's when they're not f- talking about you, you have to worry, I think. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, so 
obviously you reprise the role of Icheb on Renegades, although not anymore as I understand it, with the with the changes they made following the following the guidelines. The whole horrible uh drama <laughs> of uh, that not all that nonsense. You know, in fact it's kind of I know you didn't didn't mean to bring that up, and we don't have to spend too much time on it. But during that whole time in crowdfunding, that's the whole reason I'm still producing and producing as well as I am now is because I got angry and I, I wanted to make, I wanted to sh- I wanted to bring back. I think crowdfunding is such an awesome platform and such a an, uh, it has so much potential for. Um, Dem- democratic choice in in the films that we get to see. I love watching. Like I saw Laser Team the other day, and I thought it was hilarious. And those mm-hmm. those guys are just a bunch of guys that you know they ra- raised close to five million or something or three million to make that movie, and it was a blast. And um, it you ha- it if, as long as there's integrity in crowdfunding, this thing will hold together. And so. I got together with Scott Baker and Morgan Loria and Tim Russ and Armin Shimmerman and Marina Sirtis and Doug Jones. And um, I produced this film called Fifth Passenger with, with Scott Baker and Morgan Loria. Mm-hmm. And um, it's fantastic. And we put every dollar that we got from the crowdfunder in it, in it. Plus, we matched funds three or four times. I don't think people know that about crowdfunding, that very often you'll crowdfund. Like, if you're going to make a movie... And you're going to make a sci-fi movie on a spaceship with digital effects and all that stuff. You and you raise a hundred grand. People are like, "All right, go make your movie." And you're like, "A uh, hundred grand is not a movie make." <laughs> but um, we were able to to match those funds four or five times over. Um, uh, I, I didn't even want to be that specific, but. Um, they we made an incredible incredible movie and I'm, I'm really excited for people to see it we're just a few weeks away from being finished we're hoping to premiere in toronto i, I hope people go check that out www.5thpassenger.com and i'm really proud of what we did and uh, I'm, I'm moving on to uh, the circuit now these last couple of years mm-hmm. yeah um i was going to ask you about fifth passenger a bit later on actually but the um Sort of back to Renegades just quickly. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, you got the, the opportunity to pick up each Ichieb again and do something differently with him. He's a different person than he was in Voyager. But, you know, there's still shades of that character that was in Voyager there. What was it like picking him up after so long and, and changing him? You know, how much kind of input did you have into what the character was becoming at that point? Yeah. In the second one, he became Jaren. Yeah. In the first one, he's Ichib. Uh For legal reasons. <laughs> yeah, for, for, for legal reasons. Um, and I had to decide, you know, during all that stuff, whether I wanted to, to stay a part of, of it or not, um, because I didn't know if... I didn't want CBS or Paramount to be angry with me, or, you know, I, I, I don't want the studios to... You know, there was all that tension and... Um, but my the ultimate decision to stay a part of, of Renegades was that I love Walter Koenig and there was a, it was a great story for Walter and I, I wanted to be a part of that and um, I, I had gotten Robert Beltran and Terry Farrell to sign on to the circuit and and they asked me about Renegades and they were going to do it uh, I, and we all sort of made a communal decision to do this and do it right and and go away from Star Trek even though it's very Star Trek y. Mm-hmm. Um, but putting on the skin again was, it was neat. You know, it was, I understood actually the one thing that like, I, he wasn't each of anymore was the thing, you know, um, which was great. And it was a different look at him and, you know, his, his, once he got back to earth, all these horrible things had happened to him and he wasn't that intelligent anymore. His brain had been sort of fried by all the Borg technology that, Section 30, 31? I'm tired. Yeah, yeah that <laughs> stuck into him. Um, so it was a, he was a new character at, at the same time as it was still, there were shades of him left, but he was angry and, and intense. And um, it was, was kind of sad to play him because there were so many lines that weren't him 
So I kept running to Tim Russ and going, each of wouldn't say this, you know, like get out of the way, bitch, like things like that. <laughs> um, and so we ended up just cutting most of his lines. Um, and it was, I think it was the right choice because I saw also, I understood why, why JJ, when he was remaking the, the franchise went, Hey, no old Star Trek actors in this. I don't want old characters. I want new actors. Because if you come back to an, if you, if you're trying to remake something and you bring somebody that thinks they know what Trek is to the, to the, to the cast, then you've got that battle between, hey, I know what this is and you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I sort of, I sort of fought that battle with each of because I was like, Bleh. maybe you want to get a different actor to play this guy because this isn't each of, you know? Um, but I, so that was the most interesting thing is I, I enjoyed doing it and I, and I, and he looked cool. He, it was fun. It was not, nice to hang out with uh, some of the old crew and get directed by Tim. And at the same time, I had this interior battle about this isn't the way I, that this isn't the guy that I used to be. And so it was sort of like, uh, yin and, uh, it was, it was ha- half, half full, half empty every day. You know, I was like bummed out one day, excited the next. It was, but how the whole thing turned out, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it. I, I, I like, uh, I watched the premiere of the first episode in Vegas at the, one of the conventions, they had a premiere outside the convention and to a packed house and, and people enjoyed it. And that's really all that matters in the end is, is that we that people enjoyed it. And I, th- I think the second episode is a, um, a much better uh, story than the first two. So I, I think people will like, like it too. I think episode two should be out pretty soon here. Yeah. I haven't had the chance to, I think part one of it is or something, but I haven't had the chance to watch it myself yet. So I will at some point sit down to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned fifth passenger earlier and you know, this, it's a film you had crowdfunded as you said, yeah. um, I actually quite like the idea from what I read. It's a really interesting little character driven concept, you know, just piece, a certain, essentially a bunch of people stuck in a small room. You know, yeah. I always kind of like those things. And obviously it wouldn't be out of place as an episode of Star Trek in, in itself, you know, just stick these characters together and see what happens. Um, so, I mean, who do you play in this film and kind of what should we look out for? Is it a positive tone? Is it a comedic tone or is there a mix of stuff in there? He's sort of uh, he's sort of a wreck, man. He's like um, he's fun. It's a fun character, and it's a fun it's a fun space thriller. It's sort of a space horror slash thriller. Um, and yeah, a bunch of people stuck in a space pod that's gone. In the beginning, it's blasted off of this mega ship that is on its way to a new planet, and the they've lost their antenna array, so they can't find their way back to the main shipping lines to try to get picked up. Um, and they're running out of air and water and food and et cetera. Um, I forgot the question. Well, you kind of answered oh, it. Sure. What we so should look good. out for tonally and all that stuff. Yeah, so yeah, is, uh, Thompson and he's great. He's, he's, he worked. So on these mega ships that are on their way to this new earth, um, they, they have, you know, uh, uh, they're so big that there's a citizenry, there's a class of citizens on earth. The Yellowstone caldera has exploded. And so there's a couple of domes that have been built and the people inside those domes are the rich, the elitists, the 1% that could, could afford to survive. And outside the domes are sort of these lower class people that are just fighting to live and living off scraps and, and, um, then if you're going to get inside the domes and be like a worker class, you're referred to as a roach. <laughs> and so on these mega ships that are now moving the upper classes to the new earth, um, the, I'm, I'm a roach, you know, I'm one of the guys working down in the, in the, in the chicken coops and the goat coops and the, of the, uh, lower parts of the ship, just sort of a farmer, you know? Yeah. Um, and who knows that he's never going to be a citizen. He's never going to have a great life and he's probably never going to even get to see the new earth. He's probably just going to keep 
working on the ship back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And suddenly he finds himself in this situation. And um, so he's fun. He's sort of like Thompson and it. Well, Thompson, that's the character's name. But uh, what's his name in Aliens? It's like Bill, the late Bill Paxton. He was fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hudson. Hey, so, like, Hudson, no, sorry, yeah. Hudson, yeah. So, you know, he's got sort of a little bit of that to him. He, um, sort of pessimistic, you know, uh, and, you know, I'm just going to enjoy what I can while I can because everything's fucked, man. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a good character and all the characters are good. It's a, I, I'm really proud of that movie. I think we all produced the heck out of it and we did it for the fans and the fans igni- ignited it. And um, I can't wait for people to see it. I, I'm really, really proud to present that to the to the to the world. And Scott Baker and and Morgan uh, also did such a good job. And Morgan was able to find matching funds for us, and mm-hmm. uh, just exciting. We, you know, I, I think people will really enjoy it. And when when can we actually watch it? Well, I, we're we're hoping to be ready for t- Toronto. I, I mean, we're 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 done. We're just waiting for a couple of visual effects and a, a final sound mix. And uh, I think within the, you know, it, it it always it all depends on how quick we sell it. But I've produced a couple movies now, and I know that we have a pretty damn good product. So I think it will sell pretty quickly. Um, I think we'll be out in a few months at the, at, the, at the most. Cool. I'll keep my eyes peeled then. Yeah. Well, probably cool. earlier, but you know, it, it yeah. depends on whether we play a couple festivals first and or we go straight to to you know release. Cool. Uh, but soon, very soon. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. When we were setting up this interview, you mentioned uh, something called Abilene, but I couldn't find much information on it. So oh, can you talk about about it? Yeah, the, they changed the name. I saw it yesterday. They changed the name to Hickok. Oh, right. That would be why I couldn't find it then. <laughs> yeah, I, I was looking at my uh, IMDb page the other night, and it, uh, yeah, Hickok is now what Abilene is called, and it's it's a movie about Wild Bill Hickok and his life, and um, I play a, a, a bad guy called Slade, and um, I've been playing a lot of bad guys lately. Yeah. <laughs> um, but these, the, uh, it, it was fun because uh, the lead characters were played by Luke Hemsworth, uh, who's a great, great guy. And I, 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 I got to know him a little bit and, uh, introduced him to another friend of mine, James Bird, who's making a movie right now. And, and I got sat him and Luke down and Luke ended up getting cast in that movie. And I, I've got a role in that movie too. And, um, a good experience all around. And it was a Western. It was fun to, fun to shoot the Western guns. And, uh, I, I hadn't, I'd done a Western before and got to put the get up on, but I never got to do any of the action stuff. So I got to have a gunfight in that one. And that was fun. Um, It's a Timothy Woodward jr. Movie. And that'll probably be out pretty soon too. They, he, his films tend to, he cranks them out a couple couple of years. So (laughs) awesome. And you mentioned, uh, literally like right before Aaron earlier on, uh, where you got to work with Kobe Smulders among other people. Um, yeah, she was is that awesome. a comedy or is it? There's a, a drama or yes. I mean, it says comedy drama on IMDb, but you know what does uh, that mean? It's a fantastic. Well, you know, it's a dramedy. That's what yeah. I always call those. Um, you know, it's it's a it's funny. Yeah, it's really funny. I mean, it's, it's got uh, Kristen Kristen Shaw and um, a wise his name slipping me right now. My scenes are with him, Justin Long and Kobe Smolders and um, Kobe was awesome. And in fact, Kobe's the whole reason why uh, James is, uh, you know, uh, over there right now uh, making his film. Uh, I, I liked Kobe and we, we got to talking on set and, I, and my, my friend was making this film and I, I loved his work. His name's James Bird. Mm-hmm. He's one of the directors on the circuit with the project that uh, we're going to get to. But um, he ha- and he was making his third film, and I thought Kobe was perfect for the lead role. And I, I said, I said you should meet this kid; he's fantastic. You should go sit down with him, and and you're going to love his movies if you just watch them. And so she did, and then she ended up signing on to the film, and that brought it to her major agency, and and um, brought the film a lot of heat, and a bunch of other people signed on. And then Kobe, unfortunately for her and 
not and not for the film because the film's still getting made, but she had to Marvel picked her up for a couple of things, and so she had to sign off. Um, but she was she's been so kind, and she's kept writing letters to my my buddy James and thanking him for the opportunity and saying we she wants to work together down the road and I'm, she's glad his film's getting made at her agency and et cetera. And she, she's a awesome human being. Um, yeah. Can't say enough good things about that woman. Honestly, stud. <laughs> Excellent. That film is called literally right before Aaron. Yeah. And it's, 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 uh, d- directed by a friend of mine, Ryan Agold, uh, who I did a, a, a really, a, a film a, a few years ago that, it didn't turn out the way we wanted it to, so I don't even even want to talk about it. But he was he was an incredibly talented guy, and I knew it. Um, and uh, an, uh, also just a spiritual, awesome, humble individual. He's he plays Tom Keen on the Blacklist and mm-hmm. the Blacklist Redemption, and um, so he was making his directorial debut, and it's it's hilarious. He he wrote it and directed it, and it's just a, a cute story about a guy that gets broken up by the love of his life that he's been with for years. And she suddenly is getting married at like a month later. And he's like, well, how is this happening? And he gets invited to the wedding and the idiot decides to go. And, you know, it's, <laughs> it's just that, you know, and it the plays. Hilarity on, ensues. Yeah, yeah ex- <laughs> ex- exactly. You know, it's like, um, and you can, you can relate to it in life if you've ever been dumped by somebody that you love because it's like, oh, my God. Could you imagine going to the wedding of your, you know, that somebody you thought you were going to marry a month later, <laughs> somebody else's wedding? Oh, that would be horrible. It'd so be, definitely be horrible. So uh, Justin Long gets to be that guy, and, and he plays it great. I mean, I was there for a week, three, four days, I think. Um, I play a supporting role, and... Uh, just but the four days that I was there uh, watching the other takes, it's it's hilarious. It's going to be really fun. Cool. So uh, now we're on to your uh, your big project that you um, you're promoting very heavily at the moment, the circuit. And I like the idea. Um, I think it's an interesting concept. I have donated to the Kickstarter myself, so, uh, so I'm you. one of your contributors. Um, so. In your own words, just uh, talk us through the concept and, and how you see it evolving and, and where it sort of came from in your brain. Well, thanks for supporting uh, and getting the $10,000 executive producer package. It's very kind of <laughs> that you. Uh, I'm glad that you're on board. Um, the, uh, the concept is something that's, I don't know, also been a part of me since I was very young. I grew up in the late 80s, early 90s, and we had – old reruns of the twilight zone at the same time we had the new twilight zone we had outer limits we had steven spielberg's amazing stories we had uh, nightmare on elm street we had tales from the crypt we had tales from the dark side we had all these incredible anthology shows on at the time and i love anthology series i love science fiction standalone episodes where you get to look at a morality play one by one by one and Honestly, that's what the original Star Trek was. It was a space soap opera, but the original episodes were, you know, as it evolved, it sort of became, as as it became, you know, next gen, et cetera, et cetera. It became more, but the original series, they were mostly standalone episodes that were like, very much like the Outer Limits, Twilight Zone. They all had yeah. their own point. They they had their own theme, their their own beginning and end. Um, and I think those are some of my favorite episodes of Star Trek, and I, I want to bring that stuff back. So I was sitting around with uh, Walter Koenig in a, in a diner and a, a couple writer buddies of mine a couple years ago, and we were like, how can we bring a science fiction product to the table uh, but that also thanks the fans because if you're a science fiction fan and is, or uh, actor and especially a Star Trek fan, the loyalty of the fan base is um, something that you can't miss if you've been around to the convention scene. If you've been, you get this opportunity after Star Trek to travel around the world and, and meet the fan base, and they put on these amazing conventions and they've blossomed to you know pop culture conventions and um, 
the it's become this huge phenomenon and so long story short really we we came up we came up with this concept of 10 science fiction episodes that all take place in this large mega city in the future probably it's very futuristic uh so called urbiesa mm -hmm. and each science each sci-fi episode will be a different subgenre. so you'll have a sci-fi romance you'll have a sci-fi thriller you'll have a sci-fi epic if we get big bucks we'll have a sci-fi action film we'll have a sci-fi film noir but each one will be a different subgenre of science fiction and there's a really intelligent story that vaguely in, in, a, in the smart way that Black Mirror does uh, connects the, the tissues of the stories together. But what, and we wanted to bring back the, you know, Star Trek ethics and the, the Roddenberry ethic of uh, conscientious, cerebral, intelligent, mind bending, heartfelt sci-fi instead of just explosions and aliens and death and dystopian nonsense. Uh, so that's the concept, and we we want to do ten episodes this weekend. Uh, you know, we our Kickstarter is getting close to a hundred thousand dollars. If we reach two hundred thousand dollars, I have two investors that are willing to match funds with me. So that'll get us up to that quarter. I mean, at, up over a half a mil. And at that point, I've I'm friends with just because I've lived here for so long since I was a kid. A bunch of my friends are A-list actors, and at that point, we can put a couple A-listers in it, and we can make the season. So this weekend, we have five days left in the Kickstarter, and we're asking science fiction fans around the world in all different Facebook clubs and Twitter clubs and convention offshoots and online gaming. We're asking science fiction fans to on Saturday, May 20th, to take two minutes out of their lives to sit down and give $1.00 to the circuit to bring back conscientious Star Trek, Star Wars ethics of looking for the light within ourselves to better our future, to better ourselves type of sci-fi back to big budget TV. And we're doing a show live on Facebook at the circuit movie called the circuit challenge. A bunch of the cast will be coming on. We'll have new trailers. We'll have fan videos from people that have seen the circuit and picked up on it. And we'll be live uh, all day on Saturday from 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time on the West Coast in Los Angeles to midnight. Uh, but the Circuit Challenge starts for 24 hours, Saturday at 12.01 a.m. to Sunday at 12.01 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. We're asking sci-fi fans around the world to stand up and give a dollar to bringing back shows like Outer Limits and the Amazing Stories and The Twilight Zone and and then stuff it full of Star Trek ethics and, and conscious <laughs> conscious science fiction. You know what I'm saying? You get what I'm yeah. – so that's that's what we're doing. And, and we hope that you know the top ten groups, we're going to track it and during the live show. And the live show will be a, a lot of fun, Robert. I mean uh, – so many people are coming on. Um, uh, Walter Koenig will come on. I think Robert Beltran's going to be there. Armin Shimmerman. Um, uh, Olivia Diablo is coming on. Tim Russ is coming on. Uh, we'll all be Skyping in throughout the day. And also, the show is not run by me. This is what's so cool about the circuit. This is the part I've forgotten, which is the essential message of the whole thing. We wanted to do something to thank the fans, and we wanted to make a show that the fans could be involved in. So for every single episode of this science fiction show, we're bringing on 10 people from around the world to collaborate and be a part of its creation. So you get to see the city of Urbiesa through a different lens, through a different director, and through 10 fans that come on to help out, whether it be in makeup or wardrobe or visual effects or whatever. Um, and if you want to submit to be a part of the show, you can submit at monuentereme at the circuit film dot com. Um, you can also reach out to us. We're on Facebook at the circuit movie, Twitter, Instagram at the circuit movie. Um, the message will get to me, but if you want to go directly to my email, it's monuentereme at the circuit film dot com. 
and send us in what you do, what kind of art you like, why you would like to be involved in the film. And we're going, not the film, the film series. I keep, I call it a film quality television series. So it always comes out film. Um, and five of the people are going to be amateurs, just people that are passionate. They want to come on and they want to learn. And five of the people will be, um, people that show us some of their art. And what happened is I, at conventions, you see people that they build props and they, they make costumes. And sometimes the props are better than the ones we used on show. And I'm like, there's so much talent out, out there. And there's so much passion for sci-fi out there. Let's, let's put, you know, fans, professionals and celebrities together and see what happens. And we have an incredible team. If, People out there that are listening to the show, just go check out the Kickstarter. The people that we have behind the camera are just as exciting and, and as talented as the actors we have in front of the camera. And then we're going to bring on the fan base as well, and we're going to have this uh, science fiction experiment that we think will be amazing. Sounds great. And your event on Saturday, uh, it sounds a bit like a modern telethon, you know, the I don't live yeah. in the U.S., but I know enough about what those are. You know, so uh, yeah. Well, it's a telethon, but yeah, it kind of is. You know, we're yeah. not, and, and we actually are selling, the, you know, perks as well. So you could to- you could totally call it that. Um, but we're really just asking everybody to raise up. I want to get a hundred thousand sci-fi fans from around the world. I know there's people out there that want that kind of sci-fi back on TV, and they want to see positive science fiction back on television. Um, if somebody asked me to give a dollar to get back the Twilight Zone and Outer Limits and and Steven Spielberg's amazing stories, I just had to give a buck. I would sit down and give a buck. And so we thought, let's ask people. Let's see what happens. If a hundred thousand fans from around the world all give a dollar, that will be wonderful and beautiful, and uh, we'll make headlines. It'll be um, also revolutionary in in the way that we. Uh, you know, um, fund films. Uh, they always talk about it in crowdfunding. It's, you know, mm-hmm. it's always talked about. What if everybody sat down and gave a dollar? You hear it all the time. But I thought the only people that could pull that off, maybe, were the, interna- the international sci fi community, the international sci fi fandom. We consider ourselves a family. Every time I'm at a convention, I'm, we're, tr- we're, we treat each other right. We, what we have each other's backs we're like-minded so i'm like maybe we can pull that off so i've been calling the 501st and the 1701st and i'm like (laughs) you don't have to be star trek or star wars anymore it's all about the same thing it's about it's about you know science fiction ethics star wars is about looking for the light within yourself you know not going to the darkness the lizard brain roddenberry's star trek is about the same thing it's about bettering mankind um and there needs to be more shows like that. So we're trying to make one. And hopefully the sci-fi fan base will all raise their hands and give one buck to do it. Oh, the last thing. I'm sorry. This gets complicated. <laughs> this gets complicated. But so what we're doing to try to help people move along, too, in the clubs is if you're a part of a science fiction or a, a fantasy fan club, uh, or just a pay it forward fan club and you want to be a part of this, the top 10 fan clubs that give the most money, we're going to give a special thanks to in the end credits of the movie. And any fan club that raises more than $10,000 will get opening title credits. And our visual effects designers that design start, you know, they worked on star Wars, rogue one, iron man, Disney's planes. These guys are badasses. Um, they oversaw Flash, DC's Legends of Tomorrow, Arrow. These guys are, you know, stud muffin CGI guys. Will design a special logo for your club, and the opening of the circuit would say, "Blah blah blah fan club brings you this fan club brings you this fan club brings you the circuit Urbiesa," and um, hopefully. That's cool, man. I think that I hope hopefully people will will jump on board and we'll raise some money this Saturday. Brilliant. Uh, I wish you all the best in in getting that together. It's really ambitious, but where would we be without ambition? So, you know, good luck with that. Hopefully, um, hopefully ten thousand people will give that dollar 
or 5,000 people give $2 or whatever, you know. Yeah, it would be great. Um, and, and, you know, anybody out there that wants to help, write me at monuentereme at thecircuitfilm.com and share our posts this week. Uh, we're, we really want to get the news out that this is happening and anybody that's watching the show, invite people to watch the show. We're going to have fun the whole time we're doing it. We're going to track it. And anybody that gives a buck, I'm going to be shouting them out. Uh, and the fans, this isn't me. That's the thing. That's what the circuits is so cool. We, we tell everybody let's plug in, just plug into the circuit. Anybody can be a part of it. You just have to, you don't have to give money. You just have to write and write me and, and plug in, tell me what you want to do, how you want to be a part of it. These fans in Missouri, Bill Morgan and Kirsten, just started this live show a couple of weeks ago called The Circuit Live, and they started playing our trailers, and they st- and I, then they wrote me, and I watched it, and I was like, this is great. You guys will, yeah, I'll get my actors to show up. Let's call. Let's, let's try to get people together. Um, and so it's been this amazing experience, this, this whole thing. And um, if the fans are going to stand up and try to raise money for The Circuit, that's what what we want you know we want to team up so hopefully it'll work and if it doesn't we had a great time trying so who cares you know yeah at least you can say you had fun that's that's um, what it's all about really having fun yeah um so last question one that we uh ask everyone uh that we interview um because we primarily cover a lot of comic book stuff on on neil before blog and talk about it a lot on this podcast so uh if you could have any superpower other than influencing people to give a dollar on Saturday, uh, what would it be? Oh man! Can you can you just pick the 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 superhero you want to be? Because the any superpower question limits you so much. Be, I want to be Superman, man. You know, because he gets. <laughs> Do to you want to have them all? <laughs> yeah, he gets to fly. He gets to be indestructible. He's got laser vision. He's you know. It, but you gotta, if you got to choose one, oh, man. God, that's such a tough choice. It really is. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, what's yours? I, I'd go I with would, flight. I, I think I, without thinking about it enough, it, it'd have to be flight. But then if you can't breathe in space, what good is that? <laughs> you know, that's why super, I want to be Superman. Well, um I'll take flight, yeah, uh, as your one. Uh, for me, it would be super speed. I hate how long it takes to get anywhere, so I wish I could just be there instantly. Oh, super speed would be good because you could slow down time. Yeah. And you could run so fast that you could fly. <laughs> so you'd get both at the same time because you could flap your arms at super mega speeds, and that's all you'd really need to fly. you just have to practice for a while. Yeah, so... It'd, it'd be Super fun. Speed. God, that's the answer. That's it. <laughs> well, um, I'll just say that it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, really grateful that you came on, and I really hope your uh, Kickstarter goes continues to raise the money that it needs to, because I do want to see the circuit. I think it's a, a fascinating idea, and I really want to see it myself. Thank you. Thanks for plugging in, man. Thanks for help making it happen. I mean, right now we we get to shoot a pilot, so... Um, that's pretty cool already. Uh, if we pull this weekend off and we get to shoot multiple episodes, then that's awesome. But anyway, a cool episode is coming. Cool. Well, thanks again for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Craig. So, that was my discussion with Manu Ente Remy. I think you'll agree it was a really interesting discussion, and on behalf of Neil Before Blog, I wish him all the best with the circuit. Don't forget to like The Circuit on Facebook, Twitter, or any other social media you can think of. If you're listening to this before or on the 20th of May, then don't forget to check out the All Day Live event. I know I will be. If you like what you heard here, then please like and subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, or any major podcasting app. And join us on the next Neil Before Pod. Neil Before Pod.